Thank you very much. You know, when we say of God that is from everlasting to everlasting, we mean exactly that. And those of you who are believers will find several scriptures in the Bible that talk about faith, that talk about moments of doubt. And many of them are known to you. One of them that I love, that talks about faith, is a conversation between Christ and Philip. When he asks of Christ, we have seen you, now show us the Father. And Christ tells him, but Philip, I've been with you all this while, but you still ask of the Father? The Father is in me and I am in the Father. For he who has seen me has seen the Father. He who has seen the river has seen the ocean. The other one that I love comes to all of us in moments of doubt. It is a conversation involving Philip and Nathaniel. And Nathaniel are involved in a conversation. He said, there is a man, he must be one of whom the prophets talked about. About whom Moses talked. He comes from Nazareth. Then he says, Nathaniel, but what good can, can come out of Nazareth? Many of us find ourselves in that space when our background is used against us and we doubt ourselves. And yet there is a sense in which doubt is the mother of faith. I remember when you read the Bible, it tells us that on the day that Christ himself was baptized, the Lord appeared as he was being baptized and told John the Baptist, this is my son in whom I am pleased. But yet this very John the Baptist, when he is in prison, he is in doubt. And he sends two of his disciples to go to Christ and to ask of Christ, are you the one or we should wait for another? And Christ does not say that I am the one. He says, go and tell John the lame walk, the blind see, the lepers are, clean, are cleansed, and the gospel is being preached to the poor. I often wonder to myself how John must have felt because he's then executed. And that is what brings me to what I want to talk about today. Character and choices. Because the world is about choices, making choices. When you look at the Bible, it has always been about what choice do you make? You who are believers will be familiar with that famous contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, the 450 of them, and the contest is organized at Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal pray unto their God and they are mocked by Elijah. 
But before that, Elijah tells the Israelites, choose you now. If God is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. And many times in our lives, we are called upon to make choices. Difficult choices. And we know the story of how it all ends up. The prophets of Baal pray unto their God and nothing happens and Elijah invokes the name of the true God and fire comes down and the sacrifice is consumed. It's about choices and is about character. The other major choice is to be found in the book of the prophet Joshua. And you'll remember when Joshua has moved the Israelites and they are facing the Jordan, the people are confused as they are wont to be confused. And he tells them, choose you now whom you shall serve. Will you serve the gods of our ancestors that they prayed to before they crossed the river, or you will serve the god of the Amorites in whose land we dwell. As for me and my house, I shall serve the Lord. It is a choice that must be made, but it's a choice that must be defined by one's character. Because as I talk to you now, we live in difficult and perilous times. The times about which the Bible talks about, the times about which the prophets have spoken throughout the ages. These are those times. These are the times that when Paul is writing his second letter to Timothy at chapter 3, he talks of those times. In the end days, there shall be a form of Christianity where people shall be lovers of themselves and they shall have a form of Christianity which does not honor God. And he proceeds to say, just as Janus and Jambres troubled Moses in the desert, so shall they do, but they shall not succeed. These are those times. These are those times that are talked about in Matthew 24, 24. That in this end day that there shall arise many Christs. And they shall work wonders. And that if it were possible, they would deceive even the very elect. These are those times. These are those times of which in Paul's letter to Timothy in the book of Romans, he says that they shall be haters of God at Roman 1.30. Shall, they shall be haters of God and they shall be inventors of new sins. They will have committed all sins and they'll invent new ones. These are those times. And these are the times, therefore, when we must ask ourselves, who are we? Because it is very easy to be a Christian when all is good. It is very easy to say you are hallelujahs when there is no adversities. It is very easy to say that on the 19th day of the month of June, the year 2023, I was born again. The Lord appeared unto me when you are in the comfort of Nairobi. It's very easy to say so. But it's not so very easy to say so when you have no food on your table. It's not easy to say so when you do not know how you shall survive. It is not easy. True Christianity is only discovered when you are faced with adversity, when you have your own little Golgotha, when you have to make a choice. And that is why Sometimes when I talk about character, 
I find great wisdom in the book of Daniel. And when you read the book of Daniel in chapter 1, it tells us that in the third year of the reign of Joachim, the king of Judah, the kingdom was captured by Nebuchadnezzar. And he took the Israelites as captives. And King Nebuchadnezzar then asked the chief of the eunuchs, Ashpenaz, to go into the land of Judah and select from within their ranks young men who are knowledgeable in the arts and in the sciences and in everything and to bring them that they may come into the kingdom, into the temple, into the palace of Nebuchadnezzar that they may be trained, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar. And we are told that he went into Judah and picked four young men. One was called Daniel. The other one was called Hananiah. The other one was called Mishael. The other one was called Azariah. And King Nebuchadnezzar changed their names. Unto Daniel, he became Belteshazzar. Unto Hananiah, he became Shadrach. And to Mishael, he became Abednego. And we know Shadrach, he became Meshach. And unto Azariah, he became Abednego. Many of us who read the Bible do not remember the names. We only remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they came to be in the palace. And Ashpenaz was instructed by Nebuchadnezzar to feed the young men with wine, with meat, which you all of us would love, meat from the palace, wine from the palace. But Daniel said, I am asking you, I do not want to eat of the meat of the palace and of the wine of the palace, because they have been sacrificed to idols. And Ashpenaz said, if you do that, it shall not be good for me. And Daniel said, give us a trial for only 10 days that you may see how we are. And the Bible says after 10 days, they looked better than everybody else. They looked better than everybody else. And after several years, they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar. And we are told that they were ten times better than everybody else in their wisdom, in their science, in their arts, in their everything, Daniel the dreamer, the interpreter of the dreams, Shadrach and Abednego, and they were revered throughout Babylon. But then we are told, as it is always in humanity, when you are doing well, you have no shortage of enemies. There are those who want to bring you down. There are those who want to malign you. There are those who want to destroy you. You remember, even in the case of Christ, the very same people who sang Hosanna in the highest are the very same who say crucify him. That is life. They sing Hosanna in the highest when they think you are going nowhere. When you are going somewhere, they say crucify him, crucify him. The history of the world is that when they are given a choice between Christ and Barabbas, the world will always say release Barabbas. Release Barabbas. That is the nature of humanity. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have demonstrated to Nebuchadnezzar that they have a gifting, that they have an anointing, that they are beloved of God, that they are possessed of wisdom that we have talked about. But then they have no shortage of enemies. And enemies are manufacturers of lies throughout the ages 
They manufacture lies. They create lies. They invent lies. They malign you. They dehumanize you. They humiliate you. They denigrate you. And if you allow them to do that, then you collapse. And they hold parties about it. And some of your worst enemies are your closest friends, in quotes and quotes. That is why we sometimes say, Oh Lord, save me for my friends because my enemies I know. So it is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So somebody looks at them and see Daniel doing very well. Shadrach doing very well. Meshach doing very well. Abednego doing very well. And they are not happy with that. And they go to the king and say, Oh king, you are a great king. You must be worshipped. And they make an idol of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar gives a decree saying that everybody shall worship that image. And of course, they worship that image. And they have set a trap for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow unto that image. And they are reported to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar summons them and say, I am told that you have refused to worship my image. Why? And they tell Nebuchadnezzar, we worship only one true God. And we shall not bow unto anybody. And the decree has said that anybody who disobeys Nebuchadnezzar shall be thrown into a furnace of fire. And this is the most beautiful thing that I've ever loved, they say. If you throw us into the fire, the God that we serve will rescue us. But even if he does not. Because many of us only worship God when he does that which we desire. But these three young men say, even if he does not. Even if he does not, we shall continue to be faithful to him. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar then summoned some of the widest chested men in Babylon. And they tied the young men and threw them into the furnace. And the Bible records that as they were throwing them into the furnace, they themselves were consumed by the fire. That is how hot it was, seven times heated over. And then a few minutes later, Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fire and he sees the young man walking majestically and he says, but we threw in three young men. We see a fourth person who is like the son of the gods. You know, when I listen and read that story, it tells me about character. It tells me about character because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel, Isbel, Shazar, you change their names, but they don't object. You can change my name. You can call me anything. Call me a fool. Call me anything. But that does not change me. You can call me anything, call me a fool, call me anything, call me Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that is only skin deep. Because a rose by any other name is but a rose. But when you want to change the things that make sense, that define who I am, who I worship, and what I do, then I'm prepared to give my life. That is character. What are you prepared to die for? This is the question. You know, it would have been very easy 
for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, O oh, king, you are mighty. We shall worship you. We shall with our mouth worship you, but in our hearts we shall believe in God. No, God says that if you are lukewarm, he shall spew you out. It is either him or nobody else. I do not know how many of you have watched the film Ten Commandments. There are many Ten Commandments. But there is one Ten Commandment which was in 1956. That Ten Commandment has Charlton Heston acting as Moses and Yul Brynner as Ramesses. And I always remember these words when Charlton Heston as Moses has gone into the mountain of the Lord and is up there and he is receiving the Ten Commandments, and when he is receiving the Ten Commandments, and he tells God, you are from everlasting to everlasting, and he says, pick me not, pick my brother Aaron, because I am slow of speech, and the Lord tells him, it is me who is the maker of speeches. I shall make you a God unto Aaron, and whatever you do, Aaron, you ask of Aaron, he shall do unto you, and he gives him the Ten Commandments, and when he is coming up down from the mountain of the Lord, below there is already a rebellion. Dathan, Janus, and Jambres have told the entire crowd of Israel, how can a man survive for 40 days and 40 nights? Let us make unto ourselves a God. Let us enjoy it ourselves, and they do. And as Moses walks down in that dramatization, he meets Joshua, who is acted by John Derek, and Joshua tells him there is rebellion, there is an attack on the people, and Moses says, no, that is the song of joy and dance and revelry. The people have rebelled against God, and when he comes down and he holds the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, Dathan appears unto him and the sons of Korah, and says, you have made unto yourself laws that you may become a king over us. We are free. And Moses says, there is no freedom outside of the law. That is character. There is no freedom outside of the law. And the book of Daniel affirms to us that when you be a person of character, you must be a person who is prepared to face all adversity and to be prepared to die for something. Throughout the Bible, there have always been men and women of character who have been prepared to die for something because ultimately what you are prepared to die for is what defines how you live. You know, when I read the Acts of the Apostles, there is a man known as Simon, Simon the Sorcerer, or Simon Magus. You will meet him in the Acts of the Apostles. He sees Peter performing miracles and he tells Peter, you know, he was a levitator. He could levitate, he could float in the air to demonstrate how great he was. And on that day, Peter prays and he stops him in the air. I don't know whether you have read the Acts of the Apostles where Simon Magus is stopped mid-air when he's levitating. And then he comes to Peter and says, this thing that you have, I want to buy it. There are people who will want to buy that which is in you because they believe that you can't be bought. But the question is, do you have character that will tell them, I have no value. You cannot buy me. Do you have the moral courage, the moral strength? Are you capable of being enticed by earthly things? Because today we have no shortage of people who are prepared to buy you for anything. Are you prepared to sacrifice? Are you prepared to sacrifice to sell your soul for 30 pieces of silver? Are you prepared? To surrender, you are all, remember, all this has been done. 
You remember that story when Christ himself is taken by Satan and taken to the mountain and is shown all the kingdoms present and kingdoms yet to come and he tells him, bow before me and all these shall be yours. But can you do it of your own will? No, you are weak. You are made of clay, you are weak. You cannot resist it. When you are properly tempted, you will fall. History has shown the fall of men because they were weak, because they avoided the right thing. Tell me if you read the book in the Genesis, they were weak. Adam was weak. Eve was weak. Abraham was weak. That is when he is confronted, he was weak and selfish. He says, Sarah is my sister. He was weak. Samson was weak. Moses was weak. People are weak in the Bible. When they don't go to God, they are weak. Everybody is weak. Strength only comes when you believe in a power that is outside of you. And that is what character is all about. That is why when Christ is told, you are a good man, he says, who is good? But only God who is good. When you are weak in the flesh, that is when you become an instrument for God. So the choice is yours. Because today, as I said, we live in perilous times. When the word of God is perverted, you must have a discerning spirit. And that is why Paul says that when he went and he met the Christians of Berea, he liked the Christians of Berea. Because the Christians of the Berea, when the word had been preached unto them, they went back and looked at the word and said, is it true? There is no shortage of men, even the, by the devil himself, can quote scriptures. He did on that day when God assembled the sons of God and the son of men. And he came and the Lord asked him, well, what are you doing? He said, I've been loitering around the world. And he told God, oh, God told him that there's a man who pretends to love you, but he does not. You tempt him a little. And if you tempt him a little and if you take the thing that he has, then he will deny you. And he said, you go unto Job. Do all the evil things against him, but do not take his life. And the things started disappearing one by one, one by one, one by one, one by one. And the friends of Job came to him one by one, one by one, telling him, Oh, Job, why are you worshiping this God who cares not for you? Why don't you turn against him? And his own very wife told him, Job, why are you continuing to worship this God? But he had character. He had character and he withstood the tsunamis. Can you withstand the tsunamis? Can you withstand the tsunamis that we now face in this country and in this world? When you live in a world where the worth of a person is measured by material things. If you are a lady, we are asking you, which perfume are you wearing? Is it Donna Karan? And if you don't wear Donna Karan, we don't think you are doing very well. Which bag are you carrying? Is it Louis Vuitton? And if you are not carrying Louis Vuitton, we don't think you are doing very well. Which watch are you wearing? Is it Rado or Rolex? Which car are you driving? These are the things that are testing your character. Can you withstand all those tests? Or you will succumb. Because these are the latter day balls. These are the things that have been made unto us that they may test us. And if you are a man, which underwear are you wearing, they will ask? Which shoes are you wearing? Is it Tommy Hilfiger? These are the question: which tie are you wearing? Which car are you driving? Is it a V8? 
or a Range Rover? Which gold are you going to sell or pretend to sell that you may please the other John says? There is no shortage of temptation, but yet you must be strong enough to say, like Alexander the Great, empty-handed I came and empty-handed I shall leave. Vanity of vanities, you must be able to say with Solomon, I've tried all these Solomon of the Bible, of whom we say he was wise. He says in the book of Lamentation, if it is women, I had a thousand of them, 700 as my wives, 300 as my concubines. If it is clothes, I had the most beautiful clothes on earth. I had it all. But then Solomon, the son of David, says it is all vanity of vanities. Character. Sometimes I imagine to myself on that day of judgment, when the books are open. And all of us, we pretenders who are present in these and many assemblies, who look pious as if we are heavenly baked. <laughs> On that day, when our sins known and unknown are opened unto us, And they are counting them one by one. Will you withstand the test? Will you? You who are so pious, you who are giving tithe on a daily basis. Oh, you who. You who could say the hour and the minute when you are born again. You was a Bible thumping Sunday and Saturday attending church on a daily basis. But you who were alone was Jezebel. <laughs> Will you withstand the test? Because character is not about what you do to please us. Character is about what you do because it is good to be good and because it is divinely ordained. You can cheat us most of the time. But God says he is omnipresent and omniscient. Every act, every thought he says, he says, I number the hair on your head. When you are dealing with such a being, you must be very careful. Extra careful. Because he knows you are very act. You are very thought before you think he knows. And that is why we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's only by his grace. But we must make effort. In fact, sometimes I dare think at the risk of being heretical that on the day of judgment, we shall be made to pass on the basis of our effort. There is a column, I think, in the marking scheme of heaven, which is called effort. What effort did you make genuinely to do good in this world? And that is why I understand Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, the result is not in our hands. We shall do that which is good and right, but we are not responsible for the result. That is why they say, we will worship the true God, but it matters not. If he does not rescue us, he does not cease to be God. You and me, we perennial sinners, we evildoers, you and me. Who are in the business of thinking that a church and God is running a lottery and a casino where we buy the ticket and we win the jackpot. And if we don't win the jackpot, then we blame God. We are doomed. There is no casino in heaven. There is no lottery ticket. Salvation is not a lottery ticket. No. 
If you think it's a lottery ticket that guarantees that you shall have a beautiful life, that when you become born again, then you are shifted into Shangri-La or El Dorado, the land of gold. No, your life begins to be painful when you accept to do the right thing. One of the most dangerous things to be today in this country called Kenya is to be a honest man and woman. If you are honest, you are endangered. If you are truthful, you are endangered. If you want to do good, you are endangered. We have become a land where we canonize thieves and demonize saints. This is the land in which we live. We have become a country where virtue is vice and vice is virtue. We have become a country where we have turned material things into God. We worship men and worship and we mock God. We go to church every Sunday and even to most and we mock God. We cite the Lord's Prayer, mocking God. We cite the creeds, mocking God. God is patient. In Paul's letter to Romans at chapter 1, verse 28, it says, I shall abandon them, that they may do what it is that they want to do. Because they have become inventors and innovators of new sins. That is who we are because we have no character. So the most defining things throughout the ages is character. If you have character, you must show it. And at critical times, even the weakest of men in critical matters, they have always shown character. When Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans, Go ye into the unknown, and behold, he went. Moses left the palace of the pharaohs into an unknown land, sojourned in the desert for 40 years, and he goes back to the pharaoh and does one of the most foolish things, empty-handed. He says, the Lord my God says, let my people go by faith. Joshua goes crossing the Jordan and makes a choice when everybody else is a coward. He says, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. A bunch of cowards. If you have an, the disciples of Christ were a bunch of cowards, all of them, because they thought like we always do, that Christ has come to to, to build a kingdom where they would be ministers. And that is how I understand the sons of Zebedee when their mother accompanies them. How many of you have accompanied our children to a government office? It's the same thing. They accompanied their sons to Christ and said, we want one to be on your left side and the other one to be on your right. And Christ says, as to who shall be on my left and right, it is not me to determine but the father. But they shall be. They were disappointed because they thought that this man would come and change their world. And many of us who worship God, we come to work, we come to this sanctuary expecting a miracle that if the reverend, my good sister Natasha, prays to you tomorrow, the doors of all jobs in the world will open unto you. No, that is for God to determine. Not her. We are instruments of God, and God has his own time of choosing. Yet we say, oh, it did not happen, and therefore God does not function. Yet this bunch of cowards who, after Christ has been crucified, they go out and they are saying, there came a man, there was a man who came here. And this man came and he was crucified and everybody goes back to their fishing. Peter goes back to his fishing. Everybody goes. And one day on the journey to a mouse, something happens. These semi-literates, these cowards suddenly become totally different. And on the day of the Pentecost, 
Something happens to them and people are saying, what has happened to them? It is in the morning, they are drunk and Peter says, but how can we be drunk in the hours before noon? Because alcohol was consumed in the afternoon. They are speaking in tongues and the world was never the same again. 2,000 years, that message, whether you doubt it or not, it is alive and well. And there is no shortage of doubt as that message is alive and well. I remember listening to one of the most classic sermons ever delivered by a man, Billy Graham, in 1971 in Chicago, in the United States of America. We asked, who is this Jesus Christ? And he said, this man, whom, whether you like him or not, when you meet him, you are never the same again. And he says in that sermon that look at the young rich man who comes to Christ and Christ asks him, do you want to join to see the kingdom of heaven? He says, have you obeyed all the laws of Moses? And he says, I've done all that. Then he says, there is only one thing that I want you to do. Go and sell all your things. And once you've sold them, follow me. And the young man goes dejected and Christ then says, how difficult shall it be? For a person to get into the kingdom of heaven. Character. Choose you now which you, what you shall worship. It is temporal things. All the divine and clear things by faith. And this message has been preached and will be preached for a long time. And you who are present here today, I'm asking you to wear the spirit of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Let your name be changed. Let them call you all they want to call you. But when it comes to making a determination of what is good and what is right, tell them I shall do that which is good and right because it is good and right to do so. And I shall do so at the pain of death. And let what will be, be. God bless you because he is from everlasting to everlasting. Amen.